Well, it is a privilege to be here with you all, and welcome to those who are online. We're glad that you're joining us there. Uh, on the way in, if you're a new person today, so glad to see you, and we're honored that you're here. Um, out, out in the foyer, there are notes, and so if you're interested in those, those are available. The messages and services go online if you want to go back and review stuff. I know often in sermons, there's lots of information. And I do not expect that you're going to remember it all, okay? I write the sermons, and i like, what did I preach about three weeks ago or four weeks ago? <laughs> I spent a lot of time on them. But as always, you are prayed for. As always, we ask that the Lord would speak to our hearts. And I trust perhaps that has already taken place. And so I'm just looking for a phrase or a concept or a, um, I don't know, a, a word from the Lord that would catch you. It could be a sentence, it could be a word, it could be a paragraph that would help you and help us. The goal of our church is kind of like a greenhouse that we are looking to develop people in the faith. And we all come in and some of us come in strong, we're doing well, we just need a little breeze or a little sunshine. Others come in as a uh, breezed, a bruised weed, uh, not a bruised weed, that's a different thing. <laughs> a bruised wick, that's what I meant, or reed, that's what I mean, uh, in that we need some extra care. But ultimately, the goal is that Christ would be glorified and that he'd be seen in us as we are connected to the vine. Because apart from Christ, we can do what? Zero but connected to him as we see his spirit moving in us. He produces his image in us, produces the fruit of the spirit through us. And as our roots grow deep, so to speak, that when the storms of life come, and if you've lived longer than three seconds on this planet, you recognize that um, storms come. And so when those things happen, that whatever they may be, right, challenges from outside, challenges perhaps relationally or internal, that you will continue to stand in the Lord because your roots are built or deep into the rock. And that is a beautiful, marvelous thing. So again, it is really a privilege to open God's word together. And we indeed need the Lord, and we can say amen to that, right? <laughs> I need the Lord some days just to drive in the roads of Rockford. <laughs> Lord, help us, right? So we need him every day to be like him for sure. And if you don't know this, Scripture tells us that we exist because of Christ. Our very beings, if you thought about that, the air in our lungs to our very atoms holding together within our body. Scripture says, is because of Christ. We're made by Him, we're made through Him, and we're made for Him, right? Regardless if you acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, you are here because of His grace, His power, His mercy, His goodness. And not only do we need Him for our existence, we need Him to forgive us of our trespasses. And I say collectively are, but also as individually. <laughs> God, our good Father, perfect, mighty, loving, delightful in every way, set things together. <laughs> Gave us opportunity to know him, to experience his goodness, and so doing, give him praise and interact with him. But of course, we as collective humanity went our own way. We grabbed what was told is not good for us, and we believed the lie that it's, our way is better than God's way. We continue to do that even to this day. Every time that we insist that we know better than God and go to places in which He designed and said it isn't good for us, we are saying to Him, my way is better than your way. 
I know what I'm doing, please. Obviously, you don't. (laughs) This is problematic. So we need Christ not just to live, but we need Him, of course, to be reconciled, which is to be made right with God. 2 Corinthians 2. Second Corinthians tells us this, that God made him, who is Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that we will become the righteousness of God. That's an incredible verse, and perhaps you don't even view yourself that way, right? But I want you to know that what Christ did, He took our sin, which is incredible, the debt we, ate, we um, rang up, the bill that we rang up, He paid for us. But it's just not taking away the negative, it is putting or ascribing to us the positive that we now become the righteousness of God. That is mind blowing. It's scandalous in some ways. But this is what we have in Christ, and that if we believe in Him, giving our life to Him, we will have eternal life. Life now, yes, but also eternal in His name. And that is the goal that John the Apostle has for us, as he wrote, being instructed or being blown by the Holy Spirit in writing this gospel. And we've been spending a lot of time in it. I think we're week 45 or 46, looking in the Scriptures what we can see of Christ, that we would answer the question, who is this man? Now, John, of course, has a conclusion. He says, indeed, he is the Son of God. Indeed, he is the Christ. But each of us have to understand by the evidence that was given, who is this man? From his miraculous teaching to his miraculous power to his wondrous display of both strength and compassion, Who is this man? Now, most of us in this room have made that decision. And so those of us who have, the goal is that we would understand him more clear. And in so doing, we experience more of his goodness and understand God's heart, understand God's goodness, understand these promises so that Jesus would be treasured more than anything and anyone. Treasuring Christ is the essence of believing in Christ. Often people say, well, I believe in Christ or believe in God. Well, I want to tell you (laughs) that the devil believes in Christ, that he's the Son of God. A better question is, do you treasure Christ? Would you not exchange Him for any riches or any position or any pleasure? Do you treasure Him? My hope is that we as a congregation would treasure Christ and acknowledge His greatness and follow him because we get to, not because we have to, right? because we love him. And so in the Gospels, we see the glory of God in the face of Christ. We've been seeing lots of things about him. And we're nearing the end of the story. We're in John chapter 19. And if you do have a Bible, go ahead, open it up. And if you have been with us these last several weeks, you'll remember that now we're seeing the various ways that Christ suffered. From being betrayed by a really close friend from being denied to being rejected, 
abandon, and all of these things. And we'll see more ways as now we are getting into the excruciating, physical, literal torture that he endured. So in our passage today, uh, I'm going to highlight how Christ continued to suffer, but I do not want us to lose sight of why he suffered. (laughs) He didn't have to, right? We saw that as Jesus fully knowing what was going to happen, fully knowing what he would have to endure, stepped forward to take our place. No one dragged Christ kicking or screaming through into the cross because if he wanted to, as we know and have seen with just one word, everyone that opposed him would have been no more. With just a call as the captain of the angelic armies, he would have had support unlike any general has ever seen. And yet, he knew that what we needed most was a Passover lamb. What we needed most was the thing that he provided and the thing that he could only provide, which is redemption, salvation, and new life. And so Christ, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. And so as we again look to how he had endured, I want it to hit us anew today. I prayed for that today. These passages are more familiar to most of us. We know, most of us, but not all of us, know how Christ suffered. But when we look to it today, my my prayer is that something would hit us anew. Or maybe we'd understand again deeper or fuller or stronger the love of God seen in what He carried for us. Now the first thing we're going to see in this passage is that He carried our curse. That's my main first point. This is John chapter 19. The verses will be on the screens. Uh, NIV version is right in front of you in the pew. If you want to take it out and if you prefer to look at it that way, please do. And so as we look this first little section, note how Jesus carried our curse. So here we go. John 19, starting with verse 1. Now, this was... Um, The story is at this point that Jesus had been betrayed, he'd been denied, he'd been rejected by the chief priests, they wanted him to be crucified, Pilate brought him before the people, gave them a choice between Jesus or the one called Barabbas, a criminal, who would you want me, Pilate said, to set free And the people said, give us Barabbas. And so verse 1 of chapter 19 picks up from that point. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. 
When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now there's a famous painting called Behold the Man. Perhaps you've seen it. If you can put it up on the screen. There it is. This ring a bell for some of you. By Italian artist Antonio Sorisi. And he seeks to capture the scene. On the right side over here, we'll see um, the scribes, I imagine, with the, the rolled up scroll, scroll, knowing that they're a part of this scene. You'll see two ladies there, and perhaps the one turned away, as other um, gospels record. Pilate's wife had a dream, <laughs> told Pilate, hey, have nothing to do with this righteous man. Right? She warned him that might be her, I don't know. On the left side, of course, you see the, sh- uh, the, the soldiers, those who are um, bent to torture him, really. And then there's this chair here, which we'll read about in a little bit, the Bema seat, or this is the judgment seat, where Pilate, when sitting upon it, pronounced official judgments. Of course, you see Pilate, and he is... At this point, saying, behold the man on a mass of people who are responding to the one Christ who stands in the middle with a crown of thorns and a, looks more red, but a purplish shroud. Now, if I was going to criticize this, I would criticize it in this way. I don't think Jesus looked that good. (laughs) And I'm not talking about physical appearance, right? I I don't doubt at all that he was muscular because indeed he was a carpenter and they walked everywhere and they're eating like honey, right? I don't doubt that. But if this was capturing what was uh, present in our text There's no way Jesus looked that pristine. Maybe that's the better word. There's this little (laughs) line in here. Right? Did you? Verse 1. This line is compounded whore. (laughs) That Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Right? Now, we don't necessarily understand what that means because that form of punishment, praise God, has been abolished. Isaiah the prophet talked about this, prophesying hundreds of years before, and Jesus knew this. This is what Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah 52, describing this. He said, his appearance, the Messiah's, which we know is Christ, was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Based on that, when I look at that, He was in much, much worse shape than what's portrayed. I want to talk a little bit about floggings again because we don't necessarily understand what that is. Now, at that time that Christ was alive, flogging was a common punishment for criminals under the Roman regime. And there was three different levels of severity. Now, the first level of severity was given for kind of petty crimes, right? Someone got caught maybe stealing from a cart or, you know, whatever. They were jaywalking or whatever it was, right? And they were caught, and it was a minor offense, and so they were, quote-unquote, flogged, okay? Just a reminder that, hey, don't do this again. 
and then sent away with a warning, right? A strong warning. That was the first level. Now, there was a second level, which was fairly brutal. This is for more serious crimes. Things perhaps like, I don't know, rebellion or um, stealing something major or whatever. Lots of crimes. And a person who was caught in that, they were beaten fairly severe. And it was difficult. That flogging itself was enough to deter the person or deter those who were watching. And then there was a third level, uh, the most severe. It was unimaginably vicious. And it was always associated with other punishments, including crucifixion. And this level was the one that scholars conclude was given to Jesus. Now, in this last form, the victim was <laughs> just here, it's, it's hard to even think about this. Like if you would imagine um, reading a police report of how someone you love suffered, right? And in this last form, the victim was stripped and tied to a post and then beaten by several torturers. And in the Roman provinces, these were soldiers who were trained to do this. They did so until the soldiers were exhausted or their commanding officer said enough. So victims who, like Jesus, who was neither a Roman citizen and he wasn't a soldier, for people like him, the favored instrument was a whip whose leather straps were fitted with pieces of bone or lead or metal. The beatings were so savage that the victims sometimes died. Now, eyewitnesses of that time, extra-biblical witnesses, they record reports that such brutal um, scourgings, whippings, could leave the victims with their bones and their entrails exposed. And this was done to weaken and dehumanize the victim before they were crucified. Could you imagine that? <laughs> right. I wince when I get a paper cut. It'd be enough just to have a whip, right? That would be enough. <laughs> Closest thing I've ever well, I did get some whippings the old-fashioned way, <laughs> which were duly deserved in my part. High school, we used to take towels. You guys ever do this? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had a few of those. Um, but imagine... And again, they were meant to weaken the person who was going to be, in Christ's case, crucified to drain the blood, to cause pain. And we're going to look at this next week as one is on the cross trying to breathe, right? Imagine doing that with your back completely raw. Not just the whips, but these pieces that would bruise and then tear as it perhaps wrapped around over and over. It is difficult to think about. Here is the gentle healer, um, the glory of God, who healed wounds 
Now I had to endure wounding in a way that is vicious and brutal. Now John just gives a little verse on that. And then where he, um, what he chooses to focus in on is uh, the crown of thorns. And this was an extra measure of torture given to Christ because of this title called king or king of the Jews. So the soldiers were going to have some fun, right? Because crucifixions did happen, these things did happen, but this guy was a little different. He was the quote-unquote king of the Jews. So they thought, well, every king, of course, needs a crown. And so they took something that may have been like this. Right? These thorns are probably a couple inches. And I could not imagine what it would be like to have one of these guys. On, on my head. Right. Could you imagine that? If you ever just like nicked your head a little bit, you know how, one, bad it hurts, and how, two, it, how much it bleeds, right? So much blood happening up here that just putting this on a head, right, uh, would have been pain enough, right? And then... John goes on to describe um, how they dressed him up, and they and they took him, you know, they took his clothes off of him, and there's humiliation. Whoa, there's humiliation to that, and then they um, put a purple cloth around him, right? And this was just giving him a costume. Look at this king. Look at his majesty. This is what we do. to any king other than Caesar. And they put something like this over him, put that on his head, and another gospel says that on his left hand, because every king needs a scepter, right? They gave him a stick. And as these soldiers were beating him, they were, they were mocking him, right? as in, getting down as one would for a king or queen, right, on the knee, hail king of the Jews, and they would get up and smack him in the face. And it said it took something like this, right, this is the walking stick I have, and they'd take it from him, and they would hit him over the head. Now, getting hit by this over the head would be <laughs> pain enough, but there was the extra crown on his head. And they were merciless. Merciless. Hail. And so there was this excruciating physical pain coupled with the humiliation and mocking and hail king of the Jews. Hail, King of the Jews. Hail, King of the Jews, of pulling out a beard and spitting in the face. Now, I think John emphasized the crown of thorns, and it just, now I've read this passage, I don't know, 50 times, right, in the course of my life. It just occurred to me this week, I was praying about this, Thinking about John's emphasis on this kind of thorns made me think about where's the first time in Scripture that thorns appear? You remember when that was? You know your Bible? All the way back to the very beginning, right? Where we read the account in the book of Genesis where God created all things, set this environment up, and into it placed his crowning creation, human, Adam, Eve. And because of their trespass, there was a curse that was brought on them. 
And the curse came in, well, really three forms. One to the snake, right? One to the man. And this is where the first time in Scripture talks about that it was not good, that there was a curse, that there was going to be thorns that he would have to endure and carry. And there was going to be pain for the woman in bearing children and in those relationships. And so when I read this, it brought me back to that. And then Jesus now carrying the curse, feeling that pain birthing, per, per se, children to God. And so when Christ was doing this, John was pointing out, listen, yes, he was flogged and it was horrendous, but he carried these thorns that only came because of our trespass. Right? The God who created everything good because of our disobedience created thorns, these very thorns, and he bore on his self as he carried the curse that came to us in this planet. This was more than just a beating. This was a symbolic act saying that I carry the consequences of the curse and I carry it for you. As a man suffering in our Place carrying the curse of thorns. The curse of the results of our sin, our rebellion. The hands of humanity that reached out to the tree to grab what was forbidden were the same hands that drew nails into the crater into a tree. Here is Jesus the Christ carrying our curse. Worship him, see him, understand what he has done for us collectively, but also for you. <coughs> Suffered intentionally this way. Next thing I want us to look at is Jesus suffered from our sin. The word, by the way, from is very intentional in that. It's not for our sin, even though he did do that. He suffered for our sin, but he also suffered from our sin. Let's read this passage, John 19, as John continues to display what took place. Verse 6. Now, as soon as... As the chief priests, looking where the responsibility is lying here, by the way, as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, behold the man, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Now, in contrast, the Jewish leaders insisted, hey, we have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this, look at this response. He was even more afraid. So he went back inside the palace, looked at Jesus and said, where did you come from? Jesus gave no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? 
hey, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Can you see that in your mind's eye? The terror, the crowd, the beaten, bloodied Savior. Now, there's several things that stand out for me from this passage. The first is Pilate's response (laughs) in hearing that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. Did you catch that? (laughs) Pilate's response is um, intentionally positioned in contrast to the response of the chief priests and the original uh, religious officials. Now they, the, the chief priests, the ones who know the Scripture, right, heard the claim, investigated the healings. Those are the ones that shouted, crucify to the claims of Christ. And Pilate, this outsider, this Mm, icon of um, Roman and governmental power in contrast to these keepers of the moral and sacred law. Pilate heard the claim, and after just seeing him briefly, probably hearing about reports from him, interacting with him, he became even more afraid. Which tells me that Pilate had a greater measure of belief and faith than even the religious rulers. It's astounding. It caused him to question, indeed, perhaps, is this the Son of God, he already examined him and said, hmm, you know what, this guy really didn't do anything wrong. I don't know what you all talking about, but I see no issues with this man. And, and the religious leaders, well, we have some laws and he's got to die. He's like, what are you talking about, right? Well, if you think he's a problem and me as your ruler not wanting an uprising from you all, if that's what you want... But I'll let you know, I, he's innocent. Right? Another gospel says he washed his hands of it and said, mm, his blood isn't on me, y'all. And the crowd stupidly, <laughs> tragically said, let his blood be upon us and our kids. This contrast is... Amazing that those who were the chosen people, the insiders, had harder hearts than those on the outside. Which is a warning for us. You're here. Perhaps you're just checking Christianity out. I'm glad you're here. Most of us are believers. Most of us are on the inside. We have the Scripture. We hear the words. We worship. Let us love the King greater than our own kingdom. Hopefully you understand what I'm saying. We have to... Be careful that we love what we think is true greater than we love who is true. Second thing in this passage that stands out to me um, is the sovereign authority of God (laughs) 
over all powers of this world. That response is incredible. Pilate, I just want to let you know. And this is the one uh, in shackles, so to speak. This is the one who had been beaten. And I don't know if Christ could have opened his eyes at that point or not. He said, hey, I want to let you know that you would have no power if it wasn't given to you by a higher authority. You, Pilate, as in us as well, every power that we have is ultimately under the authority who gives all power. I want you to understand this. Kings and presidents, senators and those who are in the Supreme Court and all the way down, all of us, whatever power or influence we have, as it's on loan to us by the great one who has all power and has all authority. No one is above the authority of the sovereign God. Everyone, according to Scripture, will have our final job review. Giving of an account of how we use what the authority gave to us and what we did with it, including every president, including Pilate himself. It is a comforting and sobering reality. Comforting and knowing that in the end there will be justice for all the violations that come. And some of you have been extremely violated. In the end, there is one in which we will all give account. That helps us to bless those who persecute us. Helps us To trust people to the Lord's hand helps us not to return evil for evil, but to overcome evil with what? Good. Helps. It's also a little scary. It's really a lot scary. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if we view our life through the lens of eternity and the recognition of the glories are yet to come and a recognition that there will be an accounting, we think about our lives a little bit different. How will this choice reflect upon the great king and how will it be viewed from eternity? That's wisdom if you think about your choices with that in mind. I am asking us, and this passage to a degree asks us, to view life with a long-range lens. <laughs> Helps us to have wisdom in making decisions. God is the sovereign authority of all. May God help us with this. Third thing from this passage that stands out to me, again, is that Jesus suffered from our sins. Jesus was handed over, did you check this out, to Pilate because of sin. Because of sin, the one who handed me over to you, Pilate, even though that you are participating in this to a degree, that person (laughs) has a greater sin. Suffered for our sin, but from our sin. And Jesus was a little boy once, right, who probably was left out of some games. He was a young man once who was probably mm, 
lied about or mistreated. Jesus, of course, was a man who (laughs) was mistreated in lots of ways. We experience sin all the time. From others and consequences of our own. And it was a sin out of jealousy primarily, by the way, that they turned him over, the Pharisees. And by the way, we often think Judas, and we paint him with horns on his head, right? The betrayer. But Judas, by the way, was like a pawn. You recognize this? Now, he had complicity. Complicity, is that the right word? He was complicit in... um, his greed, which was his underlying issue, and they said they were going to pay him, so he wanted that money, and he made provision for that. And this foothold of sin entered or opened the door for the devil himself to be a part of this. There were supernatural workings here. But who Jesus, Jesus, excuse me, who Judas was turning Jesus over to was to who? Caiaphas. And Caiaphas was the one who turned Jesus over to Pilate. So the person Jesus is referencing here is not Judas, it's Caiaphas. The devil loves to disguise himself in religious garb. This threw that in for free. That's how he loves to work. Angel of what? Light. Right? He doesn't come creeping around with, you know, horns on his head and a pitchfork. Hi, I'm the devil. Want to hang out? He doesn't do that. digressing a little bit, (laughs) but you have to recognize what was happening here. Jesus suffered because of sin, not just for sin, but from sin. He understands being the target of sin. Jesus told the truth, and the Word of God continues to tell the truth, (laughs) All of us, this is crazy, Romans 3, it's not crazy, but it's true. Truth is that no one is righteous, no, not one. Well, my grandma was pretty righteous. I hope she was. She still trespassed God. (laughs) We needed God to come and rescue us, to come and reach us, to come to redeem us, to come and call us. To follow him, right? And he makes us new. Makes us new. I'm going to go on to the, the final point here. So Jesus endured rejection as our king. And John, through the Holy Spirit, is bringing these things to bear so we understand the great love of God. Verse 12, John 19, from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders, Pilate apparently was convinced of who's innocent. (laughs) But now the Jewish leaders were bringing out their, you know, their trump card, their ace in the hole, so to speak. The Jewish leaders kept shouting, Pilate, if you let this man go... Hey, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. So they were hitting him in his political, um, sensitive area, right? Pilate, what he cared about, position, politics, power, pleasure. He wanted all of those things. And they said they recognized that Pilate... (laughs) didn't necessarily care about the religious law. He recognized that Jesus hadn't done anything, per se, governmentally uh, wrong. But they were trying to get him saying, hey, 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 Pilate, I want to let you know, he, he claimed to be a king. And if Caesar, and 
Caesar was kind of a madman. He was like very sensitive to anyone opposing him and his own government. And he would kill people, even his old family members. He was like super sensitive to what was happening. And the Jewish officials knew that and said, hey, 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 Pilate, I'll let you know he said he was a king. And if Caesar hears that you let somebody go who claims to be a king, you're going to have problems, boy. Right? My interpretation. Right. So Caesar heard this, right? Verse 13, Pilate heard this. So we brought Jesus out and sat down in the judge's seat the place known as the Stone Pavement, which, is, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of... Ah, John put this in there. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Saying that as the gathered millions of people were preparing the Passover lamb. God was preparing the true Passover lamb. As those lambs were slaughtered between noon and three, the lamb gave his life for you and me. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? They responded, we have no king but Caesar. Whew, what a damning statement. Who said that? The chief priest. <laughs> Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. We have no king but Caesar. Sometimes those words are on our lips. As we hail a presidential nominee greater than the king of all things. Do you hear me? We place our boss or our spouse or our children and we decide that we would rather serve them than the God of all gods and the King of all kings. This is horrific. <laughs> and here are these religious leaders who supposedly say that they worship Yahweh as their great king said, mm, we don't have any king other than Caesar. Jesus endured rejection as our king. Rejected, 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 rejected. Jesus is indeed the king of kings. He indeed suffered humiliation, rejection, pain, sorrow. Why? On behalf of his people, which includes you, which includes me. This king is worthy of your full allegiance. Not half-hearted. Well, if I feel like, you know, going to church, I've done my duty. Wholehearted treasuring, <laughs> honoring, loving, giving. This is the goodness of God. This is our King who loves you. God, help us to joyfully and fully follow Him. Behold your King, here is your King who carried your curse, suffered our sins, endured our rejection, 
This is the one who loves you and promises a restored kingdom where things will be made new, all wrongs will be made right. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Father, we do pray this morning. As as you know, we have been looking at this passage of the various rejections and suffering because of your great love for us. God, will you remind us in times in which we do not uh, treasure you appropriately, we don't crown you as the king of our life, Jesus, we honor you. We know someday you said that we're going to see you face to face. I can't imagine what that day is going to be like. But now we believe based upon the witness of your word, your spirit's inner working in us. We're grateful. We recognize that our sins indeed are many. But coupled with that, your mercy is more, it's more, it's more. So we worship you today, Christ. We honor you, God. Continue to work in our hearts. We entrust ourselves anew today and give you praise in Jesus' name.